Hey, morning, West Press. Morning, church. Um, how's everyone doing? Yeah, I can't, I can't, I don't get responses when I ask how's everyone doing. Uh, so hope, hope you're good. <laughs> um, yes, yes, I'm very excited today because as you, as you know, um, we have been slogging through chapter five for eight plus weeks. It's been forever and I am so pumped because uh, today we get to venture forth into the great wide green pastures of chapter six. No longer are we in chapter five. We've left chapter five like the world has left shaking hands. We're, we're past that now. We're on, we're gone, we're moving on. Um, we continue with the Sermon of the Mount, however, and, uh, but we no longer feel the pressure to like minutely dive into the intricacies of Jesus' teachings um, because he has, in chapter five, it's like boom, 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 and each one of those things is super deep. And we're going to move a little bit faster. I'm going to read the first like half of chapter six, but the, the, the style of teaching has kind of been switched up. So instead, Jesus is going to talk about a main type of theme and then zero in on uh, various different ways that that theme applies to our lives. And um, so we are then going to read the, a big swath of scripture, and then we're going to look at the main theme and, and figure out how it applies to our little lives. Um, and then to boot, we're going to, uh, going to look at the gift, the sheer absolute gift that Jesus gives us to navigate all of those various things. So without further ado, I'm diving in to the NRSV Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. Hear now the word of the Lord. Beware of practicing your piety or holiness or holier than thouness. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So, whenever you give alms, that's kind of the main theme. As I read through this text, I hope you kind of pinpoint the main theme and then figure out how it's going to apply to all of these different uh, little aspects of life. So uh, again, verse two, whenever you give alms, do so, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So what your alms, so that your alms may be done in secret. And your father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. Whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father, who sees in secret, will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will, for, will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal. Like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There you have it. 
You can see the main theme, right? And all of the small ways that the main theme applies uh, to our lives and how those small ways, that the, the big main theme kind of shows up in our lives. Being genuine, right? Versus uh, favoring the opinions of others. Being real before God versus looking to impress others. And Jesus applies this general human activity to the different ways uh, the, in the different things that we do in our lives. We try to impress people with our giving. We try to impress people with our prayers and our holiness. We try to impress people with our fasting, or more appropriately for, for our day and age, with our hard work and our labor. So when you give, Jesus says, do not be great big showy donor who asks for a plaque or a bench or a building to be named after you. And do not give a whole bunch, uh, uh, a big uh, sum to an organization in order to maybe become the big donor in the organization and therefore try to exert power and control over that organization. One of the reasons why I think Paul is so underpaid at this church (laughs) is because he doesn't cater to rich donors when they come around and try to uh, donate a whole bunch of money and, and then try to dictate to him what, what to do, what to preach, how to lead. You guys have a, an amazing pastor, and you have had for years. The Presbytery uh, leaders have actually told me he's one of the strongest pastors in the Presbytery because he doesn't do stuff like that. But don't tell him that. But to bring this to the wider community... We see this in all types of organizations. We see people trying to donate and trying to be, uh, we have a a term for it. Um, And it's kind of just a term, and it can be a good thing or a bad thing, but it's philanthropist, right? Um, The the funniest thing that I I like is playboy philanthropist, (laughs) where you can be a playboy or or someone who's uh, completely consumed with other people's opinions and, and doing whatever they want that feels good in the moment, but also you're giving a whole bunch, so it's cool. (laughs) That's like, it's like, if you add philanthropist to anything, it's like a blanket of, uh, it's fine, it's fine, just, he can do whatever he wants. He gives gives us a lot of money, so it's fine, right? It's hilarious. It It just doesn't work. Then Jesus says, then Jesus rather brings it around uh, to prayer. And for our day and age, a better way to think about it, because we don't have too many people on street corners praying, we have people on street corners yelling, or rather, to this day and age, we have nobody on any street corners ever. (laughs) That's not true. A lot of people are walking in the neighborhoods these days. These days, we have people, uh, instead, a better way to think about it is acting holier. It's it's projecting an air of superiority or or, um, holier-than-thou-ness, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. These days we have people um, in churches who try to be very boisterous in their public prayers, um, very dramatic in their sermons, uh, who speak religious Christianese to let everyone know that they are in the in crowd. Speaking Christianese is still very popular today, and you guys all know what I'm talking about. Christianese kind of sounds a little bit like this. The other day I was doing my devotionals. Uh, because I was struggling with my pride, and uh, <laughs> and all of a sudden I felt the Spirit speak to me, and I could feel God's righteousness baptize my heart again. And ever since, I've just been filled with confidence in my Savior, and that I have been saved and purified by the fires of faith. Now, if you were to ask me what I just said, I couldn't really tell you very much. But I said a lot of key words there, right? Uh, devotionals. Struggling is one of my favorite, like, Christianese words. Man, I've been, I've been struggling. It's, oh, man, it's great. Uh, uh, spirit, righteousness, that's a big one. What the heck does that mean? Uh, baptized, Savior, saved, purified, fires, and then faith. Like, there's all these, like, hot topic words that let other people know, hey, I'm, 
I can speak the language. I'm on the inside. I'm on the in crowd, right? People use the disciple top to signal to others that they are in the, the club, as it were. And I hate it immensely. <laughs> I purposefully try not to use that type of language, and sometimes it gets me into trouble, but it's cool because I consider it a good kind of trouble. Actually, I had a friend defend me to a bunch of Presbyterians recently, um, and he said, I know Adam doesn't sound like a Presbyterian, but he's really pretty smart, and he's got good theology, which is hilarious because I was not speaking Presbyterian, or uh, uh, Christianese, rather, and... Um, he, he was coming to my defense in the most backhanded way ever. It was really fun. Anyway, you can see Jesus pointing out how we try to publicly display and engage uh, and be holy for others. It's all for other people's opinions. We're, we deeply care about other people's opinions for the, all the wrong reasons. And he says, yeah, yeah, don't do that. Instead, Jesus says, practice the little-known virtue of discretion. Be discreet in your praying and carry on with your lives. Then Jesus talks about fasting, which is better thought of in our day as a kind of laboring um, or or laboring or working for holy causes. Fasting in Jesus' day was a way of laboring towards some sort of holy plateau or holy accomplishment. And being seen doing it or doing that labor, let everyone know around you that you really deserve some credit for all this hard work that you've been putting in, right? Instead, Jesus says, engage in the rigorous Jedi training that is practicing the disciplines of Jesus discreetly. Do it discreetly. Carry on with your daily lives as if you weren't even engaging in the spiritual disciplines and working up a sweat doing it. Practice these things in secret. For your Father who sees in secret will reward you. All of these things make me think of muscle heads at the gym. You guys know what I'm talking about? Who, who do the exact same types of workouts that you're doing, except they scream while doing it. They're the guys who are like, ah! Ooh, bruh. They scream and yell, and, and they're doing the exact same thing that you're doing, except they're letting you and everyone else around you know that they're doing it. Jesus says, the people who do that will get their reward for doing it, which is other people's attention. Cool. That's kind of where it comes down to. Kind of like, okay, great, cool. Jesus says, yeah, yeah, don't do that. Instead, Jesus says, practice the little-known discretion, virtue of discretion. Be discreet in your disciplines, including fasting and study and meditation and prayer and solitude and so on. Church, you have to remember who Jesus is talking to and what he's talking about. He's talking to a whole bunch of people who have grown up in a very religious culture, a very religious climate and time, down the hill from where they're all sitting, right there on that hill, from the in the province of Galilee, of people who know the lingo, who know how to act, who know how to blend in to the religious folk around them. But these people have no clue as to the real, genuine spirituality that Jesus is talking about. They have no clue of the power and wholeness and health and love of the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is talking about. And you might neither. Maybe. And I would strongly argue that we are in the exact same place. We live in a time and culture that knows who Jesus is and what the whole church deal is about. At least enough to go through life under the radar, right? But Jesus is talking about something way more genuine than just cruising under the radar. That, cruising under the radar, is the same thing as being really boisterous in your prayers. You're still caring too much about what other people think. We place too much value on that. But Jesus is talking about something much more genuine than that. 
Jesus is talking about something infinitely more real than that. For many of us, prayer has turned into a passive activity where we generally give thanks for stuff and ask for stuff. That's kind of what prayer has turned into. And yet right here in the middle of our text, I just read it, Jesus being the brilliant mind that he is, gifted us with an infinitely deep poem that is also mind-bogglingly easy to commit to memory and use on a daily basis. And it is extremely active. It's not passive. And yet we repeat this poetic prayer weekly. And for many of us, we recite it weekly. That was a nerd joke. That was a word, word nerd. Word nerd here. Weekly and weekly. We recite it almost absentmindedly. So let's look at the Lord's Prayer really fast and see what's going on here. I'll read it now. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. As we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. There's two sentence, there's a two-section structure here of the Lord's Prayer. A short introduction that addresses God, and then an address to the community of disciples. You guys all hear it in the language that it uses. Now remember the number one ethic of the kingdom of God that Jesus is talking about, right? Do we know what that is? It's love God and love our neighbor right? That's the number one ethic of the kingdom. And Jesus is talking about the kingdom, this new type of kingdom. Look at the structure of this prayer, and it perfectly summarizes that ethic. It talks to God, and it talks to the community. It loves God, and it loves the neighbor. Look at the language. Our Father. This is the first half of the prayer. Our Father, your name, your kingdom, your will. And then the second half of the prayer, give us, forgive us, we forgive, lead us, rescue us. Do you see the two scriptures, the, the two sections of the prayer? It points up first and then it points around next. Love God, love our neighbor. This is a, a summary of everything that Jesus is about. And it's super poetic, in which it's like, it lends itself to our memories. It like rolls off the tongue, right? We all know this. We all memorized it. It, it feels right. And the crazy thing about this is it felt right in Aramaic. It felt right in Greek. It feels right in English. It feels right in many of the languages. That's how solid this structure is. It's as if Jesus was brilliant. Imagine a brilliant Jesus. We all think he's like this lovey-dovey guy. This guy was wicked smart, and don't forget it. Where am I? I lost myself. There I am. <laughs> but let's dive in, and we'll kick it off with our Father. Jesus is clear, is clearly drawing on some of the Psalms who refer to God, the great King, the great creator of the everything, um, as father, but uh, as far as the scripture is concerned, no one even comes close to referring to God as our father to the degree that Jesus does. It's like a blip here, blip there, blip there, and then there's Jesus who almost constantly refers to God as father. And that's important because it distinguishes a sort of relationship. Jesus is the son. He has a very intimate relationship to it. And the cool thing about that is that extremely unique one-of-a-kind, holy relationship that Jesus has with God, the Father, he then gives to us in this poem so that we might recite it from the same position, the same relational position that Jesus holds. We are to consider God our Father. And that is not some sort of distant, checked out, I'll create everything and then walk away type of God. This is a God who's intimately involved, who rules the household, who rules your lives, who rules the kingdom and the world. He's Father. And I know many of us, me included, have not had the greatest fathers of our day. But let's distance ourselves from our own personal pains 
and instead envision the best father ever. And yes, I'm also talking about Josh, who's sitting in the same room as his father, who's one of the worst fathers ever. You have a, go- you have a good father. It's just not Paul. I'm joking, you actually have a really good father. This is coming from someone who has a garbage dad, so good job. But also, that's a huge bit for people like me who have garbage dads, is we might have a garbage dad, but we actually have the best father ever. And he's not just a dad. He's also a king and a savior and a master and a teacher and a protector. That is our God. Now imagine Jesus who knows that, who knows about the family dynamics of all of us in this world and kicks off the super memorizable prayer with the very first line being our Father. Remember who you are and who it is you're talking to and what type of relationship you're in with that person. It's Father. It's intimate. It's close. It's trustworthy. It's safe. That's how he kicks it off. That's the first two words of this thing. It's, it's sad that I only have 25 minutes to do this. Because each one of these things you can, you can do a whole series on. Jesus is clearly drawing on some of the Psalms as references. But it's because of his intimacy that he keeps calling on Father. But what about our Father who is holy? Holy is your name. Hallowed be thy name. God is set apart. God is unique. Our God is one of a kind, folks. So it makes sense that Jesus, who would begin this poem with a daily invitation to remember who it is we are loved by and whose kingdom we are subjects in. Whose kingdom is it? And yes, this is a kingdom where God is king and we are not. So many of us want our will to be done in this kingdom, but it is not our will that it will be done in this kingdom. Instead, it is the king's will. He is the king, and this is his kingdom. So let his will be done. Both in the visible world that we know, called earth, and I don't know, the United States, and all the China, whatever country you prefer, and your will be done in this world as we know it, but also in the invisible kingdom that is all around us and is interconnected and is beyond our vision. It's all the stuff we don't see, the interconnected relationships that we see glimpses of every once in a while. We're like, wait, your boss is actually my second cousin's husband? Am I related to my boss? Like, It's that weird small world type stuff that we clue into every once in a while. There's a huge network of hidden relationships, and that's the kingdom of heaven that God knows all about and rules over. He is the ruler of both the visible world that we recognize and the invisible world that we don't. This one line could be a three-part series about how the kingdom of heaven and the world as we know it blend together. And hopefully in the time to come, as Jesus continues to speak about the heaven, speak about um, the kingdom of heaven, I'll be able to, we'll be able to kind of exfoliate what that means. So let's move on to the second half of the poem, though. Oriented, orienting us to our God, who is Father and King. Then we transition to how we, as citizens of this eternal kingdom, are to live and love each other in this kingdom. But we can only go there after we have acquainted ourselves with the King, with our God, who is Father. And if you think And if you look at this last half of the poem, there are three things Jesus thinks um, we should bring to our Father. And that is bread, that is forgiveness, and that is deliverance. First, Jesus says, give us today our daily bread. And this is classic Jesus because he's steeped in the scriptures, of course, right? So of course he's going to reference a really important story from the scriptures. Now, can any of you think of a story Uh, from the scriptures where the people of Israel were dependent upon God for their daily bread? Israelites in the desert with the manna coming down? Yes, yes? Uh, Of course. Of course, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I thought about that the whole time. Totally. 
I, that wasn't new information to me at all. Remember that Israel was out of Egypt, right? But they weren't quite yet in the promised land either. They were in this liminal space, this in-between space. Much like how we are today. We are living in this world and looking, but we're also looking to live in this new kingdom of heaven to come, right? And even more specifically for our time, we're in this COVID land, (laughs) which by the way, we're in week nine, day 63. Two months and chains. Uh, yeah, Woo. okay, right. Even more specifically in our COVID times, we are not living in the crazy consumerism-obsessed world of 2019, where we are worried about so many dumb and stupid things. But we're also not yet really living in the post-pandemic world, where we're all a little sobered up. This is like the biggest splash of water on our faces ever but we're not there yet because we're still sheltering in our homes which i love if you go back and read the section of basically the first half of matthew it keeps talking about god who sees you in secret which is hilarious because we're all locked in our houses in secret and god's with you in that time and that's both terrifying and comforting all at once it's classic i love it it's so unique to the time that we're living in right now and here we are we have jesus gifting us with this prayer acknowledging our dependence upon our king for every gift we received. For shelter, these, these houses that we're all locked up inside, right? For job security, which maybe is there, maybe not. Or maybe knowing that a job won't provide us security. Instead, it's the king and God who will do that. And instead, a job is more of a kind of outpouring of the kingdom and working toward the kingdom and bringing it. To healthcare, who provides that? Does our healthcare system? Or does maybe something a little bit more powerful than that and more stable and cheaper? <laughs> to the very bread on our tables, who are we depending upon for these things? Who do we look to to save us and provide us the things we need on a daily basis? Then Jesus moves to our relational status with our neighbors and delivers a hard-hitting line, forgive us as we forgive. Notice there's no forgiveness if you are not also forgiving. It's funny because Jesus says, puts this in his poem, puts this in his prayer, but then immediately after the prayers, the poem's over, he kind of talks about it. He kind of flushes it out. And he says, if you do not forgive, which is to say if you forgive or if you refuse to forgive, if you totally disengage from forgiving. He doesn't say if giving's e- forgiving's easy. He doesn't say if it takes you a long time to forgive. He doesn't talk about uh, if forgiving your neighbor is hard. He doesn't talk about any of that. That's fully on the table. What he talks about is if you do not forgive, is if you refuse to forgive. Then, forgiving may not be given to you. And this is, this is classic God. One of the hallmarks of this new kingdom seems to be that forgiving is a tentpole. It is a must. It is a necessity. And it seems to be that if you are receiving gifts of the kingdom, forgiveness you then are expected to outpour those gifts onto those around you. So in receiving, you must also give. And if you give, you will receive. There is no, well, you should forgive me, but don't forgive them because I'm not forgiving them. Instead, you cut yourself off. Generosity begets generosity. Holiness begets holiness. Forgiveness begets forgiveness. It's not easy, but it is required. So in receiving, we are expected to give. Finally, Jesus anticipates the trials of temptation we are to endure. 
This is not some sort of scenario where God is trying to like trip us up with temptations, but rather our kingdom, or rather our king, is not stupid. And he knows this world that we live in. And he knows that it will rigorously resist being invaded by this new kingdom coming to change things. We have been, we are, and we will be tempted in this life much the same way that Jesus himself navigated his temptations in the trials of the desert and in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was arrested. So Jesus acknowledges the necessity in life with a prayer of deliverance, for Jesus knows that we need delivering. Church, as we look at Jesus' teaching on the little-known virtue of discretion, about a God who sees in secret and will reward you. And his commission to us to remain present and genuine in contrast to pining over other people's opinions. Let us recapture this pure gift of this poem. I challenge you to take this poem and pray it every day this week in the morning to kick your day off, and at night to close your day down. But I I hope that you can zone in on the structure of this prayer and pray it out in your own words. So take each line, say it, and then pray whatever is on your heart regarding it. And just to get us started, I'm going to close today with a prayer doing the exact same thing. We're going to say a line of the prayer, and then I'm going to talk about what that might mean for us today. So church, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Lord, you are set apart. You are unique and holy. You are our Father and Mother and our everything, and we are your children. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, this is your house. This is your world, your creation. You are our master. You are in control. You are the king. Give us this day our daily bread. Master, we ask you for what we need today without worry for what we might need tomorrow, for you will take care of that too in your own time. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. Master, forgive us for betraying, for betraying you, others, and ourselves. Forgive us for our stupid little opinions and our snap judgments And help us to forgive others for theirs. And do not bring us to the time of trial. Do not lead us into temptation. But rescue us from the evil one. Lord, we need you for protection. From others, from ourselves, from little viruses, we need you for protection. For we are lost without you. We need you for deliverance. Deliver us. Amen.